All right, we're ready. I hit record on this machine. We'll see how many people we get in for the uh, the show of doing this on a Friday. Because we just an odd time for us. All right, everyone. Welcome to the New Media Show. Of course, my name is Todd Cochran. This is a Friday edition of the show. I'm uh, leaving for Las Vegas tomorrow morning. So Rob and I decided to do the show early. And of course, I want to welcome Mr. Rob Greenlee, my co-host. How you doing, Rob? Doing terrific, Todd. Yeah, this is un- unusual for us on a on a Friday. We usually actually do it on Sundays when, when we do this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we're kind of all over the map here to, to some degree. Um, but it's it's terrific. It's, this is going to be a really, really interesting show. This is where we dive into the new media part of our name, right? Todd? That's right. Right. They don't talk podcasting <laughs> as much. But uh, Rob, why don't you introduce our guest we have today? Well, we have Gage uh, Vandentop, who's the CEO and co-founder of StreamYard, who's joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to have him on the show to, to learn about what's happening with uh, StreamYard. It's, it's a platform that uh, we have used with the New Media Show to do our show um, on, on occasion when we're um, both out of town and stuff. So it actually has worked uh, fantastic, and I know he's done a lot of improvements and has made some terrific uh, uh, progress in this uh, live streaming video multi-user type of uh, platform. So we wanted to learn more about it. So Gage, well, welcome to the program. Great to have you on. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for uh, for inviting me on the on the show. I'm, I'm excited to uh, speak with you guys. And yeah, hello, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, when I discovered StreamYard, I was uh, pretty excited because it reminded me of some old platforms we'd use in the past. You know, we'd use Blab and a couple of other platforms. And when StreamYard came on, I was like, you know, beautiful. We've got a, you know, the ability to easily you know, do, do a live show. And I think the, the magic about StreamYard, for those of you that haven't used it before, it's, you know, it's web-based. And uh, you can essentially pipe in any camera that, uh, that a web browser essentially can detect. And maybe that is the right analogy. But you know, you can use your webcam or like in this instance, I could actually have made one of these accessible and we could have used one of the PTZ cameras as well. Um, through a little extra software on my side, but really any camera that you can get to be discoverable as a webcam can be used really on StreamYard. And you're, so you can go from all the way up from pro camera, all the way down to, you know, something's hanging off your, uh, hanging off your laptop or hanging off your desktop screen and then a whole bunch of other cool features too. Yeah, I mean it's it's an awesome platform. So, but Gage, why don't you tell us a little bit about your your background? I mean, how did you get involved in uh, creating this platform, and and what kind of uh, you know raised this topic that you, you got passionate about? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the platform's certainly very um, Blab esque. We didn't actually we weren't actually familiar with Blab while we were we were making it, but yeah, very similar vibe to Blab or, or Hangouts on Air, which is uh, now gone, of course. Um, but yeah, my background, I grew up um, in the States, but I went to uh, university uh, in Canada, and that's where I met uh, my co-founder, uh, Dan Briggs. Uh, neither of us actually have a background in um, software, so I was studying oh. uh, electrical engineering, and Dan was studying mechanical engineering. I um, mean, we just really loved working on projects uh, together, so um, during our courses, we actually had there was a lot of crossover between the two, so we ended up working on um, projects together, and uh, we found that we really loved software. So even though software wasn't our, our, our background, there was always a software component to the things we were working on. And we just loved how quickly you could iterate and how quickly you could make something really special with software. Because um, if anyone's familiar with mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, there's a lot more investment to end, and time and resources required to make something impressive versus software, where you can sort of just build something. You put in the time, you can really build something that's impressive uh, quickly. And I was always fascinated by the internet. So I sort of was the one that roped uh, Dan into uh, learning more about uh, voice over internet protocol and, and that type of stuff, just particularly like what we're on now, now Skype. I always loved Skype and how it could connect people um, all over the world. So I'm not that old, but I remember um, sort of as the internet happened, I, I do remember like the internet uh, coming out and how before the internet, if you had a niche interest that not very many people shared, it was sort of hard to find a community and, and connect with people over that interest. Um, but with the internet, it totally changed the game like small small interest suddenly you could you could form companies around that interest or you could have a whole community around that interest so mm-hmm. the internet was just always a very special thing to me and um i knew i wanted to be involved in that space so before Streamyard, um, dan and i were just working on lots of 
uh, random software projects all related to, it was mostly meeting applications, like meeting um, and webinar stuff. Um, and we were sort of looking, we, were wrap, we, had, we, were, we had wrapped up a project prior to StreamYard, and we're sort of looking at what the next thing for us was going to be. Um, and particularly me, uh, I was fascinated with the, the live streaming space, especially Twitch. People watching are familiar with, uh, I think we're live on Twitch, so hopefully yeah. people are familiar <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with Twitch. Um, but Twitch was interesting um, because it was one of the first live streaming platforms that really did live streaming uh, right. And I think it was because um, there's, it's, I mean, it's hard to be entertaining when you're live, right? So gamers had this advantage of they're, they're pretty tech savvy because they're, they're familiar with games and sort of clunky technology. Some of them were building their own computers and stuff, so they had that advantage. Um, and then they also have the gameplay to sort of offload the enter entertainment to the game. So um, I sort of thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could sort of give more tools to people that weren't gamers to be able to be entertaining and create their content without having to know too much about technology? So we just wanted to make something that was really easy and accessible that someone that didn't know, that barely even was familiar with what a browser was, could still go live and, and create, a, create content and create a community around uh, what they were talking about because i thought what twitch did was amazing there's now a whole industries around like there's esports commentators like that blows my mind and I, and i hope that by making easier tools we can sort of do that for um, other industries so that's sort of how Streamyard started you know i think about what we do here you know and it was out of a necessity we built i built the studio i started doing live in 2000 oh boy six i think 2005 and it was, you know, we're on Ustream. I think that was the only thing we could stream on at the time. I think there, there was maybe a couple of other platforms. There was no yeah. transcoding and streaming to multiple things. So, you know, we kind of, you know, from the early days, you know, out of necessity, I built this, you know, even what we're on right now with two of you coming in via Skype and you're over my shoulder and I can switch you in on the screen. You know, that's a pretty complex setup that's running off two Mac minis. It's typed into a mixer, mix minus, you know, there's a whole bunch of, cables to make it so that three of us can be on at once and you know if, if we'd have had stream yard in 2006 listen this one i wouldn't have all this crap you know because i wouldn't need it because if we're, if everyone's coming in remote anyway you know right. and if they're not here in the studio you don't you know that all i need is one or two cameras for me to change a couple of angles and then the other guests can be on a webcam or whatever and but, you know, Rob and I have found that, you know, even though Skype is quirky at times, it's been pretty successful for us over the years. But at the same point, we've been using StreamYard and having no issues whatsoever either. So we go on there and it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's better because we have a side-by-side -side view, you know, where I'm not, and I could do that here, but I just haven't taken the time to build the macros to have a side-by-side. -side. But I think that um, there is... A lot to be said about simplification and making it easy you know we're seeing that across entire podcasting space too we're having to make it very very simple for people because frankly a lot of people don't even know how to right click so and they start talking about mix minus their eyes just glaze over and roll in the back of their heads and they you know go away so they can't it's really making doing live is not easy in that sense but Streamyards made it really simple and you guys continue to add to the tool too lots of new features you know yeah, I'm going to throw up here just so I can throw up a, 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 you know, a little lower third. You know, you guys have got that already built into the system. You can throw up a lower third on StreamYard. And this is coming from a machine that's 20 grand, you know, and you guys got it built into a web browser. So it shows you where things have come. I can definitely empathize with uh, the right click. It's very, it's interesting. It's, people just don't have any patience for uh, learning technology. It has to be super easy because, yeah, I, I have, I've had quite a few of this. Like, okay, open up a new tab. And it's like, oh, what's a, what's a tab? <laughs> like, oh, okay, this is going to be an interesting uh, troubleshooting session. Yeah. Well, and, and that is what we're up against at this point. But at the same point, it's exciting that those that are not technically inclined it's this is what we're trying to work for, right? Trying to work for people being able to do content online without having to work hard at it, be able to do it. And I think that's the beauty of StreamYard at this point. I, you guys just made it real simple to go live. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, think, and that's our target customer. Like, well, I want to help the person. If you don't know what a tab is, it's StreamYard's for you. That's the type <laughs> of person we're, we're trying to attract. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's a lot of the reason why we've seen uh, uh, YouTube grow so much is because they, they they did exactly that. They made it pretty simple to to, to do and publish um, 
video on online. And so, I, you know, I mean, there's a strong connection between podcasting and, and YouTube, you know, YouTube kind of stole s- some of the thunder away from podcasting because in the early days, you know, there was such a thing as a video podcast and, and that was a, that was a difficult thing to produce and, and, and publish. And, and I think it's, it's great to see video kind of become a, you know, continue to become and growing in its presence, um, a major influence on the podcasting space. And because, I mean, a lot of podcasters and Pod and I are included in this love to do live. And that's, that's really the best way to do it. I know I was at Spreaker for a while and we did live audio, uh, but live video is kind of the, the real sweet spot of this stuff. But um, Gage, as you think about your platform, I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about podcasting and, and what's been your your philosophy of that crossover between podcasting and, and, and live video and how are you thinking about it from a product perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Podcasting is a, is a very interesting space and it seems like it's growing uh, very fast. Honestly, it's very new to me. So most of my, my knowledge uh, of podcasting has come while building StreamYard from our, our users. Mm-hmm. So lots of, it, lots of um, like we're pretty, we try to stay really in close contact with the people using StreamYard and many of those users are podcasters. So that's sort of how I've become more familiar with it and learned more uh, about it. The way I see people, uh, at least with StreamYard, uh, using StreamYard in tandem with podcasting, is the podcast is sort of their their pro- their core product, and the the live stream is sort of yep. social media marketing yep. to get people to the to the podcast. And I've seen that work really really well. Um, I think it's a especially if you sort of have a successful podcast and you're looking to to grow it. Um, I think it's a great way to sort of engage your most dedicated fans to sort of be part of the live studio. It sort of gives a live studio feel to it. And then people will sometimes do like the after, they'll end the podcast and do the, the after show. So this might change, but right now I see live streaming as a form of almost marketing for the podcast. If you're a podcaster that's utilizing live streaming. I think back to 2006, when I started doing video, people told me you're nuts, you're crazy. Why would you do video? And for me at the time, it was more of an experiment and I wanted to see what the audience would do too. You know, at the time I was only doing a solo tech show and I still do that show today, but you know, I would do 70 minutes live in a, not as fancy set as this, but something in a room and you know, there'd be a few props behind me and maybe some lights and I would talk about tech and I would put up screenshots from the computer and you know, there would be this, you know, a little bit of interaction, but I was recording this in Hawaii. So people who were watching me are really in Australia. So, you know, it was, it was kind of this weird dynamic, but then I saw what happened to my audience. And even today, my audience is about 80, 20, 80% listen to audio, 20% watch the video. Why they watch still is beyond me, but some people watch, some people listen. And this show, you know, like now we've, we're hovering 15 to 20 that are, you know, coming in and watching the show between YouTube uh, and Facebook and a variety of sites. So, you know, a number of folks will come in and watch this during the show, but when we kick this out as a podcast, it will be seven or 8,000 people that will listen to it. But to your point, we're getting interactivity with the group. You know, I can say, hey, Joe, hey, Ross, hey, Nancy, you know, all the folks that are jumping in and have left comments, we can acknowledge them as being here. And it gives that social interaction that we don't get from the podcast. So I, I think you're dead on in your analysis of how the combination works and and but one thing the show is doing live is not good for is those folks that obsess over editing because you get one shot at this you know you 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 get one shot at doing now maybe people take the audio from the live and edit it yeah but right. um you have to be better prepared but you know, talking about prepared rob and i don't prepare anything we just sit down and go <laughs> so <laughs> Well, but that's one of the reasons why we've been able to do it for 12 years too, right? That's uh, right. I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, get into podcasting and they, they realize that it, it, it's a lot of work, you know? And one of the things about live gauge is, is that it, it, it can be a really simple way to produce a program. Now, granted, it may not be the, the quality content that people perceive out there of what a quality podcast is. Um, but it's also very authentic and real. And I think playing into community is, is something that's, uh, that's a big part of this. And, and so as you think about, you know, your platform in, in community, what, what concepts are you playing with around how to, 
get listeners and content creators better better connected on your platform? Yeah, so we try to give people as many tools as possible just to be to be set up for success and to have an entertaining uh, show. So most of the people using StreamYard aren't mm-hmm. really podcasters. It's a relatively small percentage, and we're trying to um, hopefully make turn some of them into podcasters is, is sort of our goal right now. But oh. as far as, yeah, giving them tools is um, one of the most basic things we do is you can just type out lower thirds and show them on screen. So yep. that's a pretty easy way to sort of someone that's, it's pretty daunting going live when you're first starting out. So you can sort of enter the StreamYard studio, type out all the points you want to talk about. Um, and then as you talk about them, you can click to show them on screen, which sort of, it just sort of gives you some confidence. It gives the right. show a professional uh, feel. And then also, I think one of the, the features that people like most is the, the comments is sort of, that can sort of guide uh, where the stream goes and, and what, you, what you discuss. And it can sort of um, lower the, uh, the level of stress because it's like, oh, so-and-so asked a question. You can just answer that question and you can actually highlight it on screen. So you can show someone's comment on screen with their name so they feel special and uh, engaged. And then you can uh, address that, that comment. So it seems simple, but it actually does a lot like compared to, I mean, I've done it before. If you compared to just going live from your phone where it's just you looking at yourself in a screen, um, that's a, that's a lot higher pressure than being able to sort of show things on screen and, and, and address your points. It sort of gives you the, the confidence uh, you need, especially when you're first starting out, I think. One thing that we loved about Blab, and we talk, mentioned it earlier, was the audience got to saw, see the social stream. So there we, we would build this interaction as we were live and people were in our channel. They could actually see everybody's comments it would flow down the side of the screen and, and, and they were they integrated twitter so most people were tweeting or i think you could write right. a post without being on tweet to me right. in all honesty that's what separated all the services we've ever used over the years from blab is was the ability of all the audience to really interact and um and i guess maybe i haven't looked at it close enough and i know you can highlight a comment and put it on but have you guys thought about having it so when people are all can be in the channel and see this running commentary, you know, because what I also see on StreamYard is I'll see something posted on Facebook because I live stream on StreamYard to Facebook. I'll see comments coming into Facebook that don't make it back into the StreamYard comment section. So I don't know what's going on there, but what do you think about this social stream of commentary between the listeners? I, I think that really helps a lot. Yeah, I definitely think that's a, a key component. Like right now, I mean, the, one of the biggest differences between uh, StreamYard and Blab would be Blab was sort of a platform itself where they hosted uh, the streams, where StreamYard is much more focused on just being uh, a tool that sends it out to these different right, platforms. Right. Um, and sure, all the comments come into the StreamYard studio so the host can see them and, and show them on screen. But it's a very interesting uh, idea because anything that can help people uh, make a more entertaining show we're certainly interested in so it's definitely we've definitely thought about it because we could sort of have like an embeddable little widget basically that allowed people um to watch on i mean maybe on the broadcaster's own website and have that sort of combined chat feed uh together so yeah it's certainly something we're we're open to and uh an interesting idea definitely yeah because go ahead rob since you're pushing it out to all these other viewing platforms would that have to be integrated into the the actual video itself is that what you were thinking versus ha- having a player experience in in the browser that's only in the browser for consuming on on on, sc- on Streamyard. So yeah, so there'd be a couple different options. Like what I was suggesting was, um, and it basically just a nice way to embed all the live. So basically, there'd be an embeddable widget, and the person uh, would come mm-hmm. to your website or oh, yeah. Streamyard or wherever it was hosted, and could say like, "Oh, I want to watch the YouTube feed, Twitch feed, Facebook feed," but it would all just be in one widget and then um all the chat would be there as well obviously another option um that we've certainly thought about because there's a big demand especially from uh webinar folks is self-hosting so to be able to not only uh send it out to like facebook and youtube but also have your own basically rtmp poll Uh link that you could you could host yourself or maybe host um if you maybe make a micro landing page for you on Streamyard or something like that um that's farther down the line, but it's certainly something we're, we're open to. And particularly for the people that want to just host their own private uh, live stream that's not on a uh, social media platform. Yeah, one of the big weaknesses has always been 
And I think if you think back to live stream in the early days, live stream would not allow you. Well, they still don't. They do not. Of course, now it's owned by Venmo or whoever, but live stream would not allow you to take an embed and put it on your own website unless you were paying like 500 bucks a year for the, uh, you know, for the service to be able to pull out and put the embed on your website. And I always thought that was a little steep, but I also understand the cost of bandwidth and why they wanted people on the live stream page and trying to build a community there. <clears throat> but um, I think if people are willing to pay for certain parts of the service. If the service is, you know, for me, I'm big on brand, you know, and we're obviously know a lot of our audience hangs out on Facebook and that's where we primarily interact with people, but not everyone's audience is on Facebook. Some is on Twitch. Some people are on YouTube live. Some people could be on their own website. And, you know, we're at newmediashow.com forward slash live right now. We got a you know chat room over there, but most people migrate to us on Facebook just because it's easy. So, and that's one of the reasons why we multiple multi-stream, but I sure like the ability is what I do on my, what we do for a new media show is we put the YouTube live embed on the website just because it's simple i mean see i grab the embed drop it over there it's good that could be the stream yard embed could be dropped on the same page just as well as the youtube but you know and i think wherever we can find the most interactivity then that works best especially for multicasting to three or four sites if we could bring all that back in all those comments into one stream whoa that'd be yeah that'd be awesome be awesome yeah, there's uh, there's definitely it's definitely a very interesting thing that we'd we'd like to uh, explore further. The nice thing about embedding the YouTube is we don't have to pay for it, right? Right, so that's, right, uh, right. So that's yeah, right. We would offer that to people for free. If the widget I was initially referring to would essentially be that. It's like, except instead of having to worry about um, copying over the YouTube embed code, we'd sort of just make you one simple sure. link that had all of them together, so you could switch between the YouTube feed, Twitch feed, uh, or whatever. But the, the self-hosted, there's a lot of applications for the self-hosted stream. And we recently added recording, which is not all that different from actually hosting a live video. So it's, it's certainly possible for us to add. And uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be cool to sort of bring back that, I don't know what the word for it is, but the blab feel of uh, people all being in one place watching, watching together rather than sort of being disjointed. So to keep cost down for you guys now, everything on the browser essentially you're just you don't even really is is the rtmp to go to or the, the the functionality to get to facebook live do we come through a Streamyard server or does it go from the browser straight to facebook yeah so uh we do have pretty high cost so i mean we save a ton by the fact we're not hosting it right so, yeah i'm sure you're very familiar with the cost yeah. of that but uh no we do actually it does actually go to our servers and it's important we think that's very important so people that on like a Chromebook or right. uh, a low power device can have this fancy stream with the overlays and the comments on screen and the mixing um, without it sort of, I mean, I don't think it'd be possible to do on a Chromebook without it. It'd have to be a pretty powerful Chromebook for yep, it to, yep. to work. So uh, yeah, right. every time you start a stream, yard stream, it actually goes to our own uh, infrastructure. So um, you basically all your computers responsible for is capturing your webcam and sending it over to us. And then the StreamYard server mixes it all together and, and sends it out to the various platforms. And it's also nice for your bandwidth too, right? So um, instead of your own computer multi-streaming, we're doing the, the multi-streaming. Yeah, yeah. Just like today, I'm using Wowza, push into yeah. one and it's push into seven. You yeah. know, actually I'm pushing it too. I'm pushing YouTube Live. Sometimes, some for reason, YouTube Live doesn't work good with Wowza, but I push two streams. I push to Wowza and I push to YouTube Live. And those are two streams, but it'd be nice if, if Wowza, you know, played nicer with YouTube, but I just haven't had a lot of luck. Someone is asking a question here, and this is going to get super technical. Brett says, "Hi, made I hey made up to see uh, I made up to see Streamyard on the show. I'm interested in what custom tech Streamyard Streamyard has used to get their product off the ground. Do you do you own your own MCU and stun slash turn servers, or do you leverage a C pass? <laughs> so those are yeah, some very, those very, are some uh, deep, those are some good ones." You should email me, Brett. Are you looking for a job? Or is that, without his name, right, Brett? Yeah, Brett. Uh, yeah, he definitely knows his, his stuff. Yeah, so lots of, uh, and Blab was an example of it, lots of these companies use um, third-party providers to sort of host the, at least for the Skype-esque features, I guess you would right, say. So right. Twilio is a popular one, and same with TalkBox. But we don't actually use those. So to answer uh, Brett's question, we host our own. It's not an MCU. It's a 
Well, I don't know. So with the, it's kind of complicated how it works exactly. So it's sort of an SFU in combination with an MCU. For, I'm sure we've lost all the listeners at this point. But yeah, so it's, it's, uh, like, it's our, that, to, right? yeah. in basic terms, we run it ourselves. So we want to make sure that, and it's important because we want to make sure that we can always optimize uh, our video tech, right? So, 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 so the unfortunate part about, I mean, TalkBox is awesome and, and Twilio is awesome, but it is sort of out of your hands when you're relying on something like yeah. that, because most of those products are optimized for meetings and we want to be optimized for, for live streaming. So by um, using open source stuff and some of our own, uh, own stuff in combination uh, with each other, we can optimize for, for live streaming and are, and are going to continue adding some fancy stuff. So at some point we'd like to have it where even if your guest is on a bad connection or maybe all of you are on bad connections, you sort of still have this real time communication with each other so that you can actually do the show. Um, but by running our own infrastructure, we can do some fancy stuff involving caching and whatnot to still have a, the final feed goes out and looks great, despite the fact that you have um, maybe not the best, best connection. That's the type of stuff that we're working on, and we wouldn't be able to do that if we were using um, a third party. So I'm assuming, and we'll stay technical just a little bit longer, are you using cloud? Are you guys using Amazon? Are you guys, who are you guys, can you, will you say or can you say? Yeah, it's all it's all cloud stuff. We're 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 considering moving some stuff onto our own infrastructure just to save uh, costs. That's a yeah. it's a big thing to it's a big move to make though. So that would mean actually like designing a uh, a a system and right. then starting putting it in racks and yeah, that's a whole yeah. whole yeah, separate beast. But service, it's gotten to the right? point where it economically it makes it kind of makes sense. But yeah, right now it's all cloud. It's uh, Google. We use Google for some stuff and Amazon for some stuff. I. They're both awesome. I, I love I love the uh, the cloud technology out there. Well, one thing that I'll give you some some hope for as you scale <laughs> and you go from gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes, the cost gets cheaper. <laughs> yeah, you know when you get into that petabyte range, then you know then you're like, what, what's kind of funny? It's it's almost like you know I look at my hosting bill from ten years ago, then I look at my hosting bill for today, and it hasn't changed that much, but it's because I've been able to lower cost <laughs> as right. I've scaled, and um you know you get the economy of scale and uh it, it's yeah that some people often you know all these we 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 Rob and I laugh because you know there's free services that have come out, and um in the end, at some point, you have to make some money because this is it's not free to do. So what is your guys's, you know, what's the plan? What's the business plan for StreamYard? So we're fortunate that we're, we're highly profitable. So the, the main reason why we would consider moving off the cloud is just because it would allow us to do, it would allow us to provide people with better features. Like we'd love, we'd love to make it where you could have say 20 guests. It's yeah. just that that's pretty expensive, right? So right. by, by lowering our costs, we can provide um, better features. But as far as a plan, we're not like some of the other companies where it's like, oh, uh, raise a bunch of money, get a bunch of users, and then we'll figure it out later. We've been profitable since the very first oh. day, so we've always had a free version of the product. But there's enough people that um, want to use their own branding that uh, that it's not a problem. So we have a we have a functional business model, and we could stay on the cloud; it wouldn't be an issue. What is the limit now on guests? I I don't even know because it's usually just Rob and I. Uh, six people total. Wow. So you can have six. So you can have six people on screen and ten people in the studio, if that makes sense. That's, so you could sort of shuffle people in and out, but six on screen at once is the max. Yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. Really, you can have six. That's, yeah, it's quite a few. It's, it's surprisingly a lot of people are very vocal that it is not enough. They need, uh, I think, because Hangouts sort of set the precedent of ten. That there's a lot of people that want to want the ten. Is it because they have people they just want to? You know, how, how do you have a functional chat with 10 people live? I, that, That's I, a good question. It <laughs> blows my mind how they do it, but they do, they do do it. It's mostly, um, it's almost all YouTubers. So they'll have like these big community shows where it's, I mean, it's cool. It's fun. It's, it, I, I get it. It's a, it's a sort of fun mood where people just are sort of coming in and out and it's just sort of this crazy community live stream. Um, and basically most people just keep themselves muted until they're ready to talk, but they like having everyone up there on on screen, despite the fact that there's ten videos, which is kind of crazy to me. But they they utilize it. What have you guys kept your latency to between? Because oftentimes a mouth will move on some services, and then the audio will follow, or vice versa. You know, it won't be in sync. And even today, yeah. we're talking. There's probably a frame or two that is, yeah. you know, that you, it's off. that yeah. is off. 
And mm. uh, I think it's usually what is audio. Yeah, audio leads video. So that's usually yep. what the case is. So how have you guys had to deal with, you know, with that? Yeah, so uh, Dan's more familiar with some of that stuff uh, than me, but um, theoretically, you you can uh, you can set it up where you basically delay oh. the, the video and you get everything in in sync. It doesn't always work, especially if someone's computer is really um, maxed out. Like if the CPU sure. is getting hit hard, then it's a lot harder to make that. Basically, I mean, the most common thing I see is the 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 person streaming is their computer's not sending the right timestamps for the for the feeds. If the timestamps are correct, it's not very hard, right? You know, each packet has a timestamp for audio and video, and it's just like, okay, make sure that they they line up uh, accordingly. Um, but we use WebRTC, and a lot of that is built into right. uh, to WebRTC. So technically, what we do is like server mediated WebRTC. So we can do some stuff on the uh, the server side, but um, a lot of it is just we benefit from the the open source WebRTC stuff built right into browsers, and that is built into the uh, the browser that the syncing. And usually, sometimes where even the syncing has an issue is like we're even in studio. You know, Mike goes through the mixer, round it. Oh about, yeah, there's tons of things that can and, cause and then it, it pl absolutely. plugs into the TriCaster, and then you guys are coming in another channel, and it's you know it all ends up, and the TriCaster says, "Okay, I know what you've sent me." <laughs> Yeah. And I'm going to try to keep it internally synced up, but if it doesn't if it's if it's, you know, if it's lagging or ahead when it hits me and there's nothing I can do about it, you know, and then you can buy real expensive uh, atomic clocks and all kinds of crazy things to try to keep things synced up, but yeah, it's never it's never perfect and I, I always say that audiences will forgive you for your video, but they won't forgive you for the audio. The audio has to be has to nail be nailed all the time. So Rob, so Gage, uh, go ahead. Dan. Yeah, I was just going to ask Gage. Um, so are you guys allowing for a person to capture the audio separate from the video at all, or is that something that you guys have thought about? Yeah. So recently we added um, recording. It's only on on the the paid versions of Streamyard, but um, if you're on on one of the paid plans, it automatically uh, records every single one of your streams. And the main mm -hmm. reason we added that is for um, uh, repurposing so yeah so after the stream's over you can just download a single audio file or the entire mp4 nice. uh, video oh, okay uh, and it's something we'd like to add we, it's something we we want to continue to improve i know multi-track is important to some people so that's something that we're we're considering our number one priority is just to get the best quality possible out of it so um that's i sort of alluded to it before we'd, we'd like right. to make we'd like to put on the engineering caps and do some fancy stuff where even if you don't have a great internet connection that that the audio and video feed will still be great because it's it is cloud recording right it's not local so if it's local you don't have to worry about network issues right. but since we're recording in the cloud uh if you have a poor network problems. that will yeah. be reflected in the the recording um yeah. so that's something we'd like to continue to uh to improve and i think a lot of people that are doing streaming you know because they're on such a variety of different devices if you're on a low end you know windows pc and you've got you know, 18 windows open on your browser and you've got three things going on in the background, you know, that CPU is working hard and it's going to sacrifice something at some point. So you know, I always tell people if you're going to do live streaming, if you can afford to have a dedicated machine be the video audio part and then have something else to come in as, you know, the other additional tool or something with a decent graphics card in it, you're, you're probably going to be much better off. Um, because, you know, streaming still does take you know, it's video streaming. It takes a certain amount of ump and gut out of a computer. It's just the way it is. Yeah, dedicated machines definitely a, a great idea. Just to just to minimize the amount of things that can go wrong. Because if it's your own computer, and maybe you forgot about some crazy update that was happening in the background or something, and it can definitely ruin a a broadcast versus a dedicated. I use a dedicated machine with make and with updates off. It never changes. Nothing's right. going to happen to the right. computer. And then that makes. Yeah. People are going to say, you've got update turned off. Yeah, I've got machines that have not run an update in five years. You know, they, yeah. they are, they, but they don't touch the internet. That's their sole job is to do one thing. <laughs> yeah. Because if you update yeah. it, a driver gets updated and something breaks, you know, and it's, yeah, no, no, that, that's, <laughs> or you update with extreme caution. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely update it occasionally, but I'm just not the auto updates where it's like, <laughs> Computer shutting down in ten seconds. That's you right. Need to right. stop this. Like you hit stop. Like oh, too bad. We're restarting anyway. That's oh, right. Great. And I think too is you know it, it's awesome because 
your platform agnostics. It doesn't matter if you have a Mac or a PC or a Chromebook. It, it works just as long as you can have a, a webcam be recognized by the browser. Yeah, absolutely. Probably more I think that's one of the biggest things side, people too. like about right. StreamYard 2 is um, the ease of bringing in guests where it's not like they don't have to download anything. They don't have to have a particular software or system. Theoretically, you should be able to send them the invite link and it just works. They just, yeah. they just open it in their browser and then they can join you and you can, you can start your show. I think that's one of the biggest holes for people. You know, in the old days, well, not old days, a couple of years ago, these machines were connected video-wise directly into the box via an SDI connection. And now, because Skype supports NDI, basically the signal coming from these two computers back there, these two Mac minis, feed a, an NDI channel on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the TriCaster. So I don't, I just a LAN cable is all I need. And I know we were talking before we started the show that, you know, NDI is making advancements and maybe at some point it'd be something you can do in the browser. Cause that would be, cause you look at what Wirecast is in, integrated with NDI and all, you know, o, uh, OVS, I think that's a, what is it called? OVS? Yeah. OVS has yeah, it. Yeah. OVS has it. So it just makes sense that things would move to the browser at some point. And I tell people too, you look at these, uh, uh, browser based, audio recorders are out there though it's the same quality as recording to adobe edition or audacity there's no difference in the capture quality it's just in the edit process where you're maybe limited on a, a browser-based product yeah and that's changing too like browsers are becoming super super powerful for anyone that's familiar with uh the changes being made there particularly like with web assembly and things like that it's becoming where it's not so different you can the the, the limitation used to be that you could only really run like uh javascript and html in the browser but that's changing it's in a few years you'll be able to essentially run um any 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 language you want and be able to do pretty powerful things which is cool especially with well, machine learning gonna... stuff like now it's actually it's getting close to the point where you could actually deploy like a um a small machine learning model to someone in the browser which is like there's all kinds of crazy stuff you could do with that like um instead of having an actual green screen you could you could use uh, ai to or machine learning to uh to do it without the green screen or some of the uh augmented reality stuff right in the browser without downloading anything which is pretty cool that that it's not now but in a couple of years that seems like it'll be possible a couple of comments on facebook steve lee said we use Streamyard for the national podcast day and it was flawless Nancy says, I'm not geeky at all. Hate figuring tech out, but love it when it's easy and works. One might wonder why I'm here. Ha ha, but always love listening in here. And then Eileen, no, I am not. My YouTube channel is not monetized because I didn't hit that magic number of, what, 10 billion hours of uh, listening that you have to have to be, uh, to be, have a monetized channel. So I'm not one of the cool kids. And largely because we do, we hang out here in Facebook most of the time. So, Gage, as you look to the future, I mean, I, you know, your talk about the browser was was really interesting to me. Do you see us mo moving towards the world? And this is this is something I've been thinking about for the last few years now. Is this kind of this bifurcation that we have between apps and browser experiences with our, you know, our technology experiences? Do you see those worlds coming together um, and and being one at some point where? where we're not bouncing between a browser and apps all, all the time, but we're just using one experience in our, you know, in, in all of our technology experiences. Yeah, I do. I do see that. I mean, I think it's kind of already happening and, and I hope it happens entirely because it's, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to write for one platform and it sort of work everywhere, but it's interesting. I mean, you kind of already see it. Like if you're familiar with, um, Slack or, um, Right. Discord's another one. Like, there's huge companies where this, like, the Slack app is. Uh, I don't know for the, this. This this podcast yeah. has gotten very technical, but for the geeks <laughs> out there, like, the Slack app is a browser. So yeah. it's like it's this seems crazy, uh, but like, there's lots of apps that um, are basically they just take Chrome <laughs> and put their app <laughs> into it, and then you can download the app. This is like and that doesn't from uh, that seems pretty ugly from my like from uh, from my perspective. It's like there's got to be a more elegant way to do that. Um, but it, that, to me, that's a sign that it is sort of moving in that, that direction. And I, and I think that, uh, I think eventually, especially with, there's these things called progressive web apps as well, where, uh, where basically you can have almost an app like experience on your phone, despite it not being a, an app, you'll, you'll be using the, the browser. So based on what I'm seeing, and again, Dan's, uh, Dan's even more technical than, than, than me, but based on what I'm seeing, I do see things going in that direction where, 
uh, eventually it, there'll be a, this sort of mer- collision of the two worlds where uh, you can you can, where the browser is almost the same as as a native native app, especially with yeah. WebAssembly and things like that. So also, as you think about the smart agent technologies that are that are growing and developing, and even the you know the augmented reality stuff that's probably on the horizon here as we move into more more five G connectivity, how do you see that? impacting you know like a company like yours i mean is there going to be live streaming to these smart agent platforms or are we going to see you know the people controlling their experiences and their technology through their their personal smart agents that we're all kind of you know building into our lives you know i know that this is turning into kind of a future looking technology discussion but i'm just curious you know i've been really curious about kind of the evolution of podcasting being driven by the evolution of technology. And I think that there's a lot of crossover there. Yeah. So personally, I mean, I'm very interested, just the nerd in me is very interested in the future and, and all those kinds of cool technologies. But mm-hmm. from the but for StreamYard itself, we're pretty focused on just keeping it simple. So um, maybe in, maybe in a, a few years, that'll become more interesting to us. But right, right. now, uh, as far as solely StreamYard, my, my personal interest, I'm very interested in that stuff. I just think it's cool. But for StreamYard, right. our number one goal is just making it even easier um yeah. just as easy as possible like forget a we have no interest in adding ar anytime soon but just because we want to make sure the core stuff is just rock solid because like solid like you said with things like sure. yeah like like it's like leaving the things like skype um there's still little things that can go wrong and, and and stuff like that so we just want to make sure that it's the smoothest possible experience that the ar and things like that are at least now are not quite as interesting to us you know i I had to laugh though earlier when you said the Slack app. I spent all day yeah. in the Slack app, you know, living that thing, and uh, and and on my phone, on my desktop, and I don't think most people have any idea that it's a web browser. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. It's, I mean, it's, the, it's, the it's, phone it's, one. It's a, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, the 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 phone one I think is an actual. I mean, it has to be the, the phone. If if it's in the app store, it is actually an an app. But the one on your computer, like if you download Slack for your computer, that all that is is Chrome <laughs> with the uh, with the Slack branding, which is crazy. Yeah, it's always a sign when you uh, log into that Slack app. You actually log into a, a a browser experience, and then it takes you over to the to, to the Slack app. I you know th- that's where you can see those connections. Yeah. So your community's grown pretty pretty quickly, and I see a lot more people using StreamYard. Uh, just you know, you know, you got people are dedicated. You got some brand ambassadors. They're doing. I don't even know if they're brand ambassadors, but I know they're taking on shows. They're just doing nothing but talking about StreamYard and features and how to use it. That's got to be pretty exciting for you as well. Oh yeah, it's awesome, and I, I can't thank uh, the community around StreamYard enough. It's we didn't anticipate it. We sort of, at least me, when we were first starting on StreamYard, I thought of it as more of just a tool and people don't care about tools, they care about the end result. So I was sort of taken aback by how much people sort of uh, supported us and what we were doing and the tool itself and sort of how a, a community formed around the tool and how StreamYard itself is almost considered a, a platform by, uh, by many people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's amazing to see it and I'm, and I'm so thankful because that's a, that's a huge part of how we've grown is just um, people that are actively talking about StreamYard and introducing it to to others, and yeah, 2019 was a crazy year. So at the beginning of uh, 2019, like January 1st, 2019, we had 100 active broadcasters, and then like today, we have um, over 16,000 active broadcasters. So seeing that growth over a year is pretty special and pretty pretty exciting. Have you guys ever considered white labeling the platform? Yeah, it's uh, it comes. Now it's coming up more frequently where I've started having companies reach out to us to sort of create like um, an embedded experience into whatever their platform is. So it's certainly something we're, we're open to. We haven't started going down that that road yet, but um, it's it's interesting to us. And it, was, it, it could p- potentially be connected to sort of like what you said, where we offered self-hosting, where you can sort of take the StreamYard studio and put it on your, your own website. So who knows? It might happen. Interesting, because I think there's, there's a play there, you know. I, I you know, I, I think about this, I'm thinking about the stuff that I do and you know, we're about ready to go to CES and do fifty hours of live and you know, what are we gonna do? We're gonna use, you know, some of the tools we've been using, but I'm thinking if I had my own platform, you know, it'd be an awesome way to to pop around to different events during the year and be able to really 
control that message, build the brand, continue to bring people back to, I always call it Moonbase Alpha. I want them to come back to newmediashow.com. I want them to come back to Geek News Central. I want them to come to, you know, the company website, all that. And because what are we doing right now? We're building, <laughs> you know, we're building a community on Facebook and we could be deplatformed Facebook at any time. So um, not to say that they will, but, Facebook may have a business rule change and all of a sudden they say, oh, live streaming is no longer good for us. We're, we're going to do something else. And then we have to go hunt for a new home. And I always hate that. And that's, you know, part of my philosophy is try to keep everyone on, on the brand and build the brand. Yeah. I think that's incredibly important and it's easy to forget that, yeah, you don't really own <laughs> what you're doing on, on Facebook. So that as much as people rip on email lists and that the email's dead or whatever, it's definitely important to, to keep that in mind because not even like, I don't think Facebook would ever just drop live streaming, but they can change the algorithm at any time and it will fundamentally change your, your business. <laughs> and I see that all the time with people that have invested a lot in a, in a Facebook page where they used to have all this organic reach. And then one day Facebook's like, yeah, hey, we want to make more money, you know, so you're going to now pay for it. And it was good for it's people exactly that were starting out YouTube. because um, it used to be if you if you were if you had built up this organic page, you were just this powerhouse and and could hit, get all this reach. And then Facebook one day is just like, nope, it's uh, we changed the algorithm. And now it's totally based on how much people are engaging with what you're posting and how much you're paying us. So um, you definitely have to to be wary of that. And it's scary for us, too, as a platform, right? Like we're highly dependent on on Facebook. So if they ever decided like. Hey, uh, we don't want third-party apps streaming to us, or we want our own third-party apps. That's so right. That's definitely something to be be cognizant of. Cognizant of, no matter who you who you are, is and, that uh, make sure you you care about your own brand. And it's just like Google, you know. I I you know running a website, and I have you know sixteen thousand posted articles over there, and I'm dependent upon Google to feed my show, to feed new listeners coming in, and I count on those twenty to forty thousand, or as high as fifty thousand search engine results coming to the website every day, and you know, and a year and a half ago, I had a wake-up call. I wasn't paying attention to the website. Page speeds went down. They weren't loading as fast as Google wanted them to. And they put me in the penalty box. It took 90 days to climb out of the penalty box to get back on, you know, website traffic. Uh, and Google can give and they can take it away just, again, by a tweak of a logarithm. And then you spend months trying to figure out what they've done. So I think that it goes back to, again business ideas, business change, business priorities, and, you know, companies make, companies have to survive and, and put dollars in the bank, but boy, oh boy, it can be scary as a content creator out here these days. Look what happened to the YouTube folks are all demonetized. So, and deplatform too, you know, saying, oh, we don't like you no more. And, you know, someone complained because you, you said the F word or something and they, you bounce, they bounce them, you know, and then they went from, you know, lots of revenue to no revenue. So, I think the YouTube folks have kind of gotten the hint a little bit, but they're still hanging pretty tough over there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I, I definitely empathize. It's got to be a hard thing being uh, someone that's, especially if a huge part of your income is, is dependent on something like YouTube or something like, like Twitch. I'm sure it's very, very uh, scary, these random changes that can happen at any time. And uh, yeah, I would encourage you to to start thinking of yourself as more than just a, a YouTuber or just a Twitch streamer. Think of yourself as, as you and prepare it. Don't, I mean, I love, they're awesome. YouTube's right. awesome. Twitch yeah. is awesome. But just, just know that it's, uh, it can, <laughs> it can change. So be prepared. Do you, did you guys take funding or did you guys self fund your startup or how'd you guys get going? Yeah, no funding. It's just, uh, just Dan and I, um, uh, bootstrapped it. Um, and, uh, yeah, bootstrap is cool. I'm a big fan. It's, uh, I mean, I think it, you end up making a lot of the times a way better product, right? Because you have so many conflicting, um, things when you when you're working with investors, it's like, okay, should I make the best product for my customer, or should I make what the investors yelling at me to make? And I've got to raise another round. It's just, and, and when you're bootstrapped, it's just, it's very clear. <laughs> I got to make the best product <laughs> possible and make more money. It's like very simple, right? That's right. But uh, but yeah, so we from day one we we were profitable, and from day one we were put in the initial investment to to get the servers running and the sweat equity of of building the the thing. Yeah, those first few months when you drop the credit card and the credit card goes to the maximum amount and you're, you know, you're holding your breath, hoping that, you know, this is going to work and you get that trickle of cash coming in. You can start, you know, not only paying the server bill, but also paying the credit card debt off that you just incurred to get going. I think it makes you appreciate things more. And then when people come to you later 
and say, hey, we love what you're doing. We'd like to give you some money. It gives you the opportunity to say, no, I don't need you. Or, yeah, that's a good feeling to have for yeah, sure. Where it's, it's just like, no, I'll continue to exist whether or not you decide to <laughs> sign the check. And you can, you know, it gives you the ability to not only that, if you're not under the gun and if you're not like facing like running out of cash, not under the gun to take some terms that you don't agree to. So uh, I'm happy to hear you guys are powerful and did it bootstrap. I wish more startups would go that way, you know, and uh, it's harder in the beginning and you may not build as fast, but it's, you know, you don't owe nobody nothing, you know, and it's yours. Yeah, absolutely. I do think it's becoming more more common. It used to be, at least from what I've seen, it seemed like it was venture capital or, or bust a while ago. And now yeah. there's like a whole community around bootstrapping. Like there's a podcast that's really big that's all focused on. I'm sure there's a lot actually, <laughs> but there's one that comes to mind for me. I think it's called Indie Indie Hackers is all about oh, that's, bootstrapping. There you go. There's, people, a, there's a good show for everybody, Indie Hackers. Yeah, it's really cool. It's about people that sort of have taken a, a side project and are now transforming it into to a business and almost everyone there is is bootstrapped and yeah i would i would definitely i would definitely recommend uh especially for i'm surprised how many people were their first go around they they go the the venture capital route i think definitely for starting for your first one it definitely to me makes more sense to do a bootstrap where you really will get a good sense of business and and what you need to to care about and then maybe after you've done one of those you can it gives you better perspective when you're dealing with venture capital or investors about how you should be prioritizing things. You know, you always look at the way you started things and think, man, I wish I'd done something a little different. In that way, round two, if you get to a point where you're doing a round two business, you cannot make those same mistakes the second time around. So did, uh, did you guys have, did you guys do this full time from the get go or did you guys have JLBs and then you were doing this by night? How did, I'm like kind of curious, I'm always curious about folks at Bootstrap, how you paid the bills. Yeah, so Dan and I both had a bit of money from like our school was a it's kind of cool it was a co op program we had so basically you do one term of school an internship one term of school an oh, internship nice so just working at various tech companies we made a made a bit of cash but um, no we never we never uh, had like a full time job so it was just like we're we're going for it yeah <laughs> which I don't know if that's the best way to do it I would if uh, well, you might want to look before you leap um, I like I like people. I don't know why some people say to just like, oh, you got to go for it. So like, there's nothing wrong with keeping your, your job while you you're sort of explore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but no, we didn't yeah. do that. We just were like, nope, we're going for it. Yeah. My team all had full-time jobs. We were, no one went full-time for like two years. We were all working regular JOBs and then, you know, working Well, we, we didn't sleep, <laughs> you know, working a normal 40 with some company and then working an 80, you know, trying to get the business going. And, you know, that doesn't leave a lot of time for, for sheet time so he just learned to live without sleep and so that's part of bootstrapping too sometimes it's got to go that way but so awesome so up to sixteen thousand streamers what do you primarily think then are you what's your main category of folks that are using the service is there a specific gamers or you have people that are just doing hangouts type stuff what is the what's kind of the yeah. spread so it's definitely changed dramatically over time at the beginning it was almost entirely uh, marketing folks, like entrepreneurs that were that had some, they were basically trying to do what we talked about before, build their own brand. And live streaming was a big part of it. So they'd have either, maybe they had a coaching program or an actual physical product, or they were a lawyer that was trying to get more more clients by uh, doing, it was anyone that was interested in doing content marketing. Because live streaming, I think, is just a particularly uh, easy way to to do content marketing. Um, especially if you know what you're talking about. Like if you if you just have a business and you're familiar with the business, it's pretty easy to just flip on the camera and and start uh, making interesting interesting content. So it was almost entirely those folks at the bottom, and then YouTube <laughs> slowly started building up, and then it got everyone. So now it's like the Sasquatch adventures and malt liquor, uh, the the best malt liquors, like just anything, right? It's just the so, but there's sort of a division. So there's the there's still a very heavy component of the marketing folks. And then um, it might even be bigger now. The 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 YouTube folks are people that just have a an interest, whether that's like, oh, I do uh, shows about toy figures. It's just everything, like from you name it. There's someone doing a show on it with Streamyard. It's pretty cool. That's nice to see that diversity. But it's interesting to see the YouTube folks coming on using the tools to do YouTube Live, yeah. which ends up being recorded and it's a you know it's a regular release on youtube so you know that's the beauty too doing live is a lot of people say, oh i want my podcast on youtube well 
Once you podcast on YouTube, do live. And when you get done doing live, your podcast is on YouTube in its entirety. So, yeah. Rob, I've been hogging the mic here. So, no, it's okay. I was just, I was curious about your, your plans and get, you know, a, you know, for a, a viewer that's watching this or listening to us talk about it, um, you know, you, you have a free plan, plus you have a basic plan, and you have a professional plan. Maybe it's good to kind of kind of run through about you know some of the features in each of the plans and the costs and stuff. Yeah, sure. So we uh, we always want to make sure the the free plan. I've always liked it when a when a, a free plan you can actually use it. I don't like free plans where it's like you can't really get any use out of it. So yeah. um, we'll continue. We'll never stop adding things to the free plan. So we want to continue adding uh, adding useful features to the free plan. And it is pretty. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff with it. So. For anyone listening on the free plan, there's it's the same number of people, so you can have up to up to six people on screen, ten in the studio. Uh, you can show banners on screen, you can show the comments on screen. Um, the the things that you pay for are if you want to have custom overlays with your own watermark instead of our duck, um, mm-hmm. and if you want to do multi streaming is up on the paid version. So if you want to go to instead of just Facebook, if you want to go to Facebook and YouTube, that's a paid feature. Um, what else? End up. Background. If you want to have a custom background, background that's also yep. a, a paid feature. But basically, all core stuff is free, um, and uh, it's the sort of bells and whistles are, are part of the, the the paid plan. So the our recording side it says four hours. Is that per set four hours per session, or is that four hours total a month per session? So you could per session. Uh, okay. You could do. You could end up having I don't know hundreds of hours uh, of recordings. It's just per. You can only the if you if you go okay. live for eight hours, you'd only get the first four hours recorded. Right, gotcha. And if gotcha. you're going live for eight hours, you should be breaking it up anyway. But uh, <laughs> <You're> right, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. four hours, those I think. Uh, you know, if you think about video, though, my God, you know, it's recording and storing and serving video. You know, look at this show. This show ends up being like, uh, like so fifteen. Gig, right? It's like 16, 1.6, yeah. 1.6 gigs and, uh, or 1600 megabytes. And then to put that online, which I do, you know, every time this show is delivered via podcast, cause this show is delivered as a podcast later, you know, it's costing my company money because it's, it's racking up the per gig transfer fee, you know? And, yeah. uh, if I had more than twenty five percent of people watch this thing, Angela might say, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's still available as a video podcast, right? Right, right. it's available uh, video so, and audio. Yeah, yeah. but you guys right. aren't actually serving that. You're making them download it, put wherever, put it wherever they want to put it. You're not actually making that available as a as a hyperlink, are you? No, it's like their own only to them right yeah. so they, they so yeah we have to pay for them downloading it but that's a lot that's nothing compared to if all their viewers right. were downloading now i will warn you if you if they somehow figure out how to get a hyperlink to that media file yeah we we, we uh we kept that in mind so that's covered there's like uh we use the uh, signed tokens and whatnot so that's good because dropbox didn't do that and then all of a sudden dropbox figured out hey i got podcasters serving videos from dropbox <laughs> And, uh, we've got, you know, they, you know, the concurrent connections and all that stuff going on with servers and they were bringing server infrastructure down and Dropbox locked them out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was into that. But right. there's still some people yeah. that play that game. that have smaller audiences. They put their file over in Dropbox. If they only have, you know, a hundred listeners or something, they can almost get away with it, but still Dropbox sees too many concurrent connections and they go, they. Does drive let you get away with it? Who? Does Google Drive let you get get away with it? It seems like something Google uh, would sort of shrug at. I don't know. You know, to be honest with you, I don't think I don't know if you can actually find the physical link to a drive file. I don't know if there's an actual URL that they could they cut and paste. But it, believe me, when people are trying to save money, they'll don't do anything. <laughs> do anything, especially when it comes to video files. You know, because they're so big. And, yeah. You know, and to actually serve them as a podcast costs a lot of money. And to serve them yeah. as a stream costs a lot of money. People don't realize that as well. But um, right. yeah, it's the same idea. It's weird. Some people don't realize that, but it's almost the exact same. Well, it is right. essentially the exact same thing. Yeah, it is. You know, from a cost standpoint, it's exactly the same. You know, it's hey, still, Gage, um, what's the story on the the duck as your uh, logo? 
<laughs> it's not that exciting of a story. I wish I had a better story <laughs> okay. for it. Um, is when we were starting StreamYard, we just knew we knew we wanted an animal logo because uh, I was a big fan of Mailchimp's branding. I really like the the Mailchimp uh, monkey. If anyone's familiar with that. Um, but the first thing we, we came up with was the name. So we came up with the name StreamYard. Um, that's also not that exciting of a story. We just thought it made sense for what we were doing. And there's not very many dot coms available. And it was, right. we, liked it. we liked it enough. <laughs> and uh, the duck is just that we wanted a fun, lovable animal. And uh, I've seen ducks in streams and yards before. So it seemed like it fit the, fit the bill. Well, I think you guys did a better job. You know, I, we, we thought up the name Blueberry when we had a perfectly good name called Raw Voice. You know, why we didn't stick with Raw Voice, our parent company's name for all of our podcasting services, I have no idea. But, you know, it's just one of those things you do in the early years and you look back and say, well, that was kind of dumb, you know, but, uh, you know, you're already too far down the, too far down yeah. the pike to make a change. I think you guys did okay. StreamYard kind of fits. Yeah, I like the name. I was pretty happy with it when we found it. It was like, oh, it's, it's available. And it doesn't cost $30,000. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Just, just to find a dot com, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's important the, these days, the names of the, you know, of a tech company or whatever, it, it's got to be catchy and it's got to have a, you know, something that people can associate it with and it needs to be kind of friendly. And, and I think you've accomplished that. I think with your name. Yeah. I appreciate that. I hope so. Yeah. So how big's your team? I, you know, we were talking just a little micro bit before you started. You're starting to learn about hiring and that process. How are you starting to grow? Or so yeah, we're still very small. So uh, as far as like actual employees, um, Dan and I are the only official employees. We do have um, some contractors like Ross. Ross Brand does a does a weekly show for us, um, and we're sponsoring a few different um, podcasts. But I mean, that doesn't really count as employing someone. Um, but we're, we're starting to consider it, especially like uh, customer support team is probably the first thing we, we get going is um, we actually have one person helping out with that um, and growing that team is sort of what would make sense so that it frees up, uh, frees up more of my time. <laughs> yeah. So will, we, go ahead. so will we be seeing you guys or yourself at, uh, at some podcasting events like Podcast Movement or anything? Are you going to be getting out in the podcast community at all? Yeah, I would like to go to uh, to more more conferences this year. Um, I haven't yeah. sat down and planned out what what I want to actually go to. Um, it's not a podcast event, but I would like to go to to VidCon, and then VidCon, um, yeah. uh, I'd like to make it to at least one major podcasting event. I don't know which one it will be, but I, I'd certainly like to make it to at least one. Yeah, you know, it, the Mac Daddy is definitely podcast movement from size wise, and um, you know that really there's really you know there's. There's so many now, though, it's hard to really even kind of give them the, you know, saying they're the ultimate conference because you got Podfest, you've, you've got, you know, all a, a full women's conference. It just, you know, goes on and on. And then, you know, I just got hit up this morning for something. It's going to be in June and supposedly 1,200 business attendees or whatever. That was at least the marketing pitch. And uh, so, yeah, there's, there's not a shortage of events to go to. And fact, yeah, it seems like there's tons of them. Yeah, Rob and I are both, you know, we've talked about it. It's just like the travel season starts, you know, for me, it starts tomorrow. You know, right, for, it's the same with me. For 2020. Yeah. It's just kind of crazy. Yeah, you know, going yeah to so the, the, the event that Todd's talking about, Podcast Movement, is in August in Dallas. It's, it's probably going to be over 3,000 podcasters. It's, it's probably, Todd, I would say it's the biggest podcasting it's, it's event. It's definitely the biggest, yeah. yeah. And then yeah, Podfest in Florida, and it's probably right. up around a thousand, I would think, this year. Yeah, yeah, it's in March. Yeah. Uh, Do you guys host any events? Does Li Does Libsyn or Blueberry host any uh, events? No, but we sure write a lot of checks to sponsor events. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and I it, think we, and we mainly spend time supporting other events. Yeah. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's getting to the point too, where there's so many events you just can't, you know, where I'm looking at it very seriously. It's it, every, you know, you'd like to sponsor every event, but you just can't, it's not budget wise because you, yeah. you need to go be able to go back and say, okay, what ROI did I get out of that sponsorship? You know, if I have a booth there, is that sufficient? Is having a booth enough? I'm going to see the same amount of people. Yeah. I'm going to get some additional mentions on the banners and stuff, but is that really worth the ROI that I've spent $15,000 for to do that? So, you know, as you guys, yeah, how are, do you measure it? 
you for just, selfish reasons, I'd be curious. Well, you <laughs> because I thought about sponsoring uh, this. Like, how am I going to figure out if this is worth ad, the uh, same I'm spending uh, on ads? Is it worth the, new, the new same butts in the seats? It's it's basically you got to it's got to be purely on. Did you see a so bomb? You send them to a link or something. Or yeah, something send like them that. to a link. Give them promo code. You know, yeah. so, but some of it is just they're waving the flag, saying, "Hey, we're here and we're business. We're right. still around." You know, and it's right, you, maybe right. you're not going to get some ROI out of that. Maybe it's more of a, you know, you're, you're stepping up and helping the event. But well, your brand building is what you're doing. I mean, I would say most of most of the benefit, you know, from this is brand building and being being known in the industry. Yeah, uh, I think is the most important part of it. But, you know, there's also, if you're on a budget, which you guys are, you know, you've got to look at, you know, what's going to be the most bang for your buck, you know, what, what's going to be, you know, if you're looking to do brand building, then, you know, is that going to result in 500 new people come and use the service? And, you know, right. what's your, if you're, if you're advertising on the web already, you probably already know what your acquisition cost is to get a new customer in the door, or you're starting to determine that. You know, for us, Google AdWords sucks. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of Google AdWords. I think that's just like throwing hundred dollar bills down the toilet. Yeah, but AdWords it, is rough. I've had a lot of success. I find Facebook works really well, especially with uh, AdWords for retargeting. I, I, I see the biggest bang for the buck with the retargeting uh, stuff. But Facebook is by far my favorite. We do we do pretty well with Facebook ads. Yeah, we do too. We do okay with Facebook ads as well. And you know, so then it's you know, then you're watching out for the competition, right, Rob? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you guys are in a unique yeah. position right now that I don't think you have. There's a few, but you know, I think with your product's unique enough. I don't think you've got a lot, a lot of competition in this space. So I think you're ripe for a true explosion. I think you guys are, I think you guys are setting on a gold mine. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, definitely not not competitors of the scale that that you guys deal with so yeah it's a much smaller s space like the the scariest competitors for us are almost if like um youtube or, or facebook decided to make their their own tool just because they have the benefit of being able to bake it directly into their right. their platform but simulcasting yeah. does protect uh, a bit with that so but yeah hopefully uh I'm looking forward to 2020 hopefully we can keep the uh we can keep the growth rate going it'll be an impressive year well you know youtube does have a tool to go live and use your browser but it's you yeah, know, it's, it's, only to, it's, it's only to YouTube. Though. Yeah, That's or to Facebook. Thing. I mean, it, it right. just it just or, goes to Facebook. Yeah. There's no tools. Just, yeah, right. You know, right. You, it's, it's just a camera view. There's no additional real tools to use. So unless you're using something like I am or OBS or Wirecast, it, mm -hmm. you know, there's you, know, you can't add, you know, the, the cute little lower thirds and the, you know, all that stuff that you would want to have on your stream for branding. And uh, so I think you guys are in a, in a really, really good spot. Well, and also to be a platform that goes to all of them, I think is the, that's the, that's the real value prop because, you know, Facebook isn't going to make you available over on YouTube. So, you know, yeah, that's Tim, not, that's Tim, against what they do. Tim was asking, do you guys go to any niche events industry wide, industry wide outside of podcast? Yes, we do. And uh, just for competitive reasons and secrecy reasons, I'm not saying which conferences we go to outside of the podcasting <laughs> events. I, I, I don't. I, I don't need to advertise that here. I want you to find out later. Oh shoot! We should have went there. They were there this time, and I do the same thing when Rob is secretive about the events he's going to. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not that secretive about events. No, but you guys go to a lot of events you don't talk about. So you know, not just not just rob uh, green really that's going to events it's rob walsh too and uh and other members of your team so yeah we are com yeah, it's kind of funny we're competitors on this show yeah we do a podcasting show so um <laughs> that's your goal there gage is to find a competitor in the space and, and do some live streams together that i was I, I came to that uh i made that connection before we started when i was looking i was looking up utah and i was like wait blueberry libsyn like aren't these guys like directly competing with, uh, with one another but i guess you're established enough in the space that that's a bit more we, comfortable we were friends before we had businesses okay right. yeah that now makes we, more sense we, then, i guess both of us go back so far in podcasting i mean todd started in what todd did you start in 2004 october of 2004 yeah and then I started in September of 2004. So we we actually worked together on the content side, yeah, um, <laughs> with a podcast network uh, back in 2005. I fact, had a show, and yeah, yeah. 
Bet Network still alive. Techpodcast.com. As a matter of fact, techpodcast.com will be live at CES. We have a plug here next week. 50 hours of live content. You can go to techpodcast.com or geeknewscentral.com. We'll have the live embeds for a 50 hour new guest every 10 minutes. So, Todd, I think, uh, well, what wasn't that the very first podcast network? It was the very first podcast network. Yeah. Started with 13 shows. We had no idea what we were doing. Don't ever do anything as a co op. That don't work. <laughs> you know, I had this, I had this, I had this thought process, man, if we had 13 shows, we're all together, everyone equally contributes and does a little bit and we can really rock this thing. No, it's one person does the work. The other 12 were like, cool. Thanks for the ad dealer. Cool. Thanks for the, thanks for yeah. getting us into a show. God, uh, you're doing such great work oh, for us. Oh <laughs> man. So that was one of those <laughs> lessons I learned. Don't ever build a network as a co-op because you're going to end up buying it. It's going to cost you money. <laughs> and, I, and back then, I had my own server infrastructure that I was hosting my own show on. I was doing um, streaming back then. And I, I worked with Todd to do live streaming of a linear experience of all the podcasts that were part of the Tech Podcast Network. So at that time, you remember? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we, yeah we, were, we were streaming before it was... People, you know, they talk about streaming. Now we were truly streaming the show on a 24 right. seven rotation basis. Yeah. Nancy yeah. podcasters are supportive of each other from what we've seen. Yes. We, we are very supportive of one another and we independently compete, but we, our goal is to definitely help podcasters help podcasters. Well, and that's the, that's the key there is that we, we, you know, we talk to the podcaster, we find out what their needs are and it's not uncommon for us to refer, um, these podcasters to different platforms, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's something that I do too. I've been doing it for years. Uh, just like, you know, Gage, having you on the show, we, we just want podcasters to be educated and um, understand what the options are and how to best use these platforms for their benefit. Yeah. And we thought, you know, since we'd been using the platform, I was excited to hear what you guys were up to. So. Right. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. I don't think we'll be competing with you guys. Ever. No. We'd probably we're much more interested in integrating rather than than competing. But no, it's it's very cool and admirable that you guys have a have a show together. That's awesome. No, what, what if I was you? Um, this is what I would be prepared for: someone to try from the podcasting space to try, to come try by you. You would be like a huge acquisition target for some uh, podcasting group. Shh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've been we've gotten a bit of that. Not oh, not, see, net, not, see, not directly, not <laughs> podcasting directly, but other other companies have have uh, discussed. Uh, there's been whispers of that with other people. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we like what we're doing though. So we, we would, we'd, we'd rather just uh, continue growing our own business rather than you grow than it. Do that, but grow it to the point yeah, where you can get a big, fat, juicy check. <laughs> <laughs> You know, come on. So it's, it's, we live in a capitalist world. So if someone shows up with enough zeros, you can say, and it's the right terms, you know. There's some people that would definitely make sense, right? So it's, sure. I mean, so sometimes things do come down to, to, to zeros. But yeah. if, if it's, if it was like the right organization where it's like, okay, if we partner with these guys, yeah. we can make an even better product for our users and no one would be, you know, thrown under the bus, then right. it, it could make a lot of sense. But, I, I, I like, every, every, everyone says they would never do something for a whole bunch of money, but I, honestly, I, I mean, it would have, to, I think it would have to be the right person, even if it was a lot of zeros. I don't think right. I would it'd be like, okay, StreamYard's now squashed and I got a right. big enough check. So we're done now. I think, I think you and I could be good friends. I like that philosophy a lot. I do. I, because, you know, to be honest with you, building a community, you built a tool that people are using, appreciate you. The last thing you want to do is sell it to someone that's going to screw the user base. Right. Right. Yeah. You want to make sure the community is taken care of. So it's true. If someone comes to buy you, you got to make sure it's the right fit. It's the right money. It's the right the philosophy. It's the right, can you trust them? It, all that stuff, right? So, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the same way, too. Yeah. Rob, uh, we're already an hour 17 in. Anything in the podcasting space we need to cover before we get done here it's been kind of a slow week hmm yeah it has been a slow week no question about it um i don't think there's a lot to uh, not, not that i've heard about anyway yeah there's Talk been about. some stuff in the news but nothing yeah. like that was earth shattering um 
that was out and about uh, per se. But um, yeah, I've yeah. I've been hit, I've been like putting fifteen sixteen hours in here working regular job then trying to get ready to go to ES. So it's been nuts. Yeah, I'm I'm just still you know amazed about the opportunity on the global side um, of podcasting. Just you know w- you know I keep hearing about things that are happening around the world. And, um, and, and w- with podcasting and its growth and its interests, I think, I think this next year is going to see some expansion, I think of distribution of podcasts into places that may, may surprise some people. So kind yeah. of interesting. You know, one thing yeah. you guys could think about over at StreamYard is that most of the podcast hosts have APIs. So Libsyn, Blueberry S, we have publishing APIs. So if you want to make it easier for people that have created an audio file, they don't want to edit it per se. They just want to push it. There's the ability to push into our our publishing platforms right. just by linking user accounts in a simple API call. So right. you know, if you get start getting that type of a request to easily publish into other platforms, that's you know most of us have an API to be able to publish into. Yeah, I think I think that will start happening relatively soon because people are already asking for it. Like they just want it when right the streams over automatically export that audio. Out. And it makes sense. It would be a very nice integration to, to have. Yeah, and it's, it's a, yeah, I think code-wise, it's probably a couple of days, maybe three days worth of work, something to that effect, two, three days, and you're probably, you know, done. Of course, yeah, very, very easy thing to add. Yeah. Of course, you know, you, you, something about developers, you, you guys, when you say, oh, that's going to be three weeks, I just multiply it by four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, uh, I totally. I don't know what thinking it thinking is. I'm guilty there. for it as yeah. well. It's. I think it's impossible to imagine something taking longer than two weeks. It's like I'm, I'm good at. I'm good at estimating something that where the amount of work is under two weeks. Anything over two weeks is just like, oh, it'll be a few weeks. It's like no, it'll be ninety days or whatever. It's really hard to. I, that's a good strategy. Multiplying is effective for figuring out how right. long it'll actually take. The, the problem is, you devs all have this rabbit hole effect. You start going here, and you're like, oh. What's that? And you go down and you end up over here and then you go, Oh, I was supposed to be up here and you're <laughs> you're you're somewhere over there and you're fixing code you fix you touched two months ago because you yeah. learned something new and then you get back up. <laughs> that's why you doesn't don't finish in two weeks. It's yeah. then it's three months. <laughs> yeah. Luckily API integrations usually aren't aren't like that. I'd be right. concerned if they were. If uh, if if it definitely down a rabbit hole for no, that, Todd, I think they call that A D D. <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's, it's no, it's dev. It's just dev work. They you know they they, they see oh, something. It's like it's like a it's like a rabbit. You get distracted. You go down this hole, and it's like right. it's this black hole. And you never and you do finally come back, but you may have touched twenty five modules of stuff you hadn't even planned on touching because one thing up here maybe affected something down here. You just it, right. it's insane. I, I'm glad I'm not a coder. I would I'd probably end up on the end of a short rope. <laughs> 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 I just am not. You know, some people are meant to be coders, some are not. You know, that's just the way it yeah. is. Yeah. So anyway, right. well, well, we're both off to CES. Uh, I'm leaving on Sunday. Todd's leaving tomorrow. So, yep. um, I think we're we'll be back next week. I think to do a show. Right? Uh, no, I I won't be back until Sunday. I always take because we finish okay. Friday. I always decompress okay. Saturday, get stuff shipped, and then fly out Sunday. But. Um, I get here Sunday night and I leave immediately Monday morning for Columbus and I'll be in Columbus all week, but I'll be here for the following week, Saturday show. No problem. So you want to try it? I mean, is there any opportunity to do a show on Sunday? Uh, no, no way. Cause I'm going to, I'm not going to be getting back until late. So oh, I would okay. say the okay. earliest we'll be able to okay. do a show would be the 18th. Okay. Yeah. All right. And all right. And I'm, I'm going to be down in Los Angeles on the 18th. So, All right, so we can shift uh, one way or yeah. the other for that show. Yeah. Then. All right. Okay. So yeah, doing right. it, yeah, we're doing admin work right here during the show. That's how we do it. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So we've so, had a pretty good live group today, and Gage, I want to thank you for coming on. What's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, thanks so much for uh, for having me on. Um, me, I don't have much of a personal presence online, so. Google StreamYard and and follow our social. There is probably the best way to to contact me. Smart man, because <laughs> <laughs> his email box would be full. He'd never get no work done. Um, all right, cool. So um, if you haven't tried StreamYard out, definitely check it out. It's a really cool platform, easy way to get up streaming. You just need a a browser and a webcam. Prefer- I think preferably Chrome. 
It's the easiest way to use it. And, uh, and a microphone would be helpful. A, yeah, mic's good, but you know, not required, but definitely will increase the quality. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you just want to try it, try it. It's free. That's the cool thing. You yep. go out there and do do a test. You don't even you don't even have to go live on Facebook and get everything up running and not even click the go live button. So um, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I really enjoyed being on the show. Thanks. Thank you guys for having me on. Yeah, thank you. And uh, for everyone else, uh, Rob, you got anything else before we bounce out of here? No, I think that's that's probably good for today. All thank right. You. I'm Todd at Blueberry.com at Geek News on Twitter. Rob? I'm at uh, I'm on Twitter at Rob Greenlee, and that's with two E's. And I've got a website, robgreenlee.com. And you can send me an email if you have any questions or um, things you want to talk about about podcasting. Um, and that email address is robg at lipson.com. So and thanks, again, for, uh, yep, thanks for joining us. Yeah. And don't forget to go over to newmediashow.com, get subscribed to the podcast on the website if you're not already. Thank you for being here. We'll see you in two weeks from probably Sunday or something like that. We'll let you know. Yeah. See everybody next time. Take care. Gage, thanks. Yeah, Bye. Gage, thanks. Thank you. So it takes a few minutes for the stream to wrap up, but I put that banner up there so that uh, people know we're off the air, even though we're really still on the air. <laughs>